Hey guys, I'm Art. And I'm Carrie. And together with the Weberleys, welcome. We're glad you're with us at First Church today. Please remember to sign in so we'll know that you attended. Art and I began attending First Church about three years ago. And one of the things we loved about it then and now is that it gave us a safe, loving, welcoming, and diverse space for us to explore our faith and ask all the hard questions. Along those lines, we've just started a new small group experience on Sunday mornings at 930. So if you don't have a current group that you'd like to attend on Sunday morning, please join us in the fireside room at 930. We're so glad you're here today. Good morning and welcome to virtual worship. My name's Ashley Hess and I use she, her pronouns. I am the Youth and Justice Minister. Please let me take this time to share a few announcements with you. First, Wednesday night dinners are back and they are going great. Dinner starts at 5.30 p.m. An adult plate is $10 and a child's plate is five. You can't beat that price and you can't beat the fellowship that is being had around the table. Make sure you make your reservations by Monday. Following dinner on Wednesday nights at 6.30 p.m., we have programming, programming for everyone. Youth and children will have their own services. There's a study on the book of John, the dance of the dissonant daughter, small, uh, small groups converge, and open table will meet on Wednesday nights along with our choir. Truly, there's something for everyone, and we hope that you'll come join us. My next announcement is our church-wide retreat happening February the 10th through the 12th at the lovely campus of Camp McDowell. Uh, the retreat is entitled Cultivates, and we will be studying the fourfold way. Youth and children will have their own programming during the event, and it is going to be a great time. So much fellowship, so much laughter. Uh, I can't wait for the event myself. I hope that you're planning on joining us, and if you need to register for this event, you can go to the Coming Up tab and click on Cultivate, and it's super simple. So please join us for Cultivate, February the 10th through the 12th. My last announcement is First Church 101. January the 29th, following services, a light lunch will be provided, as well as child care through reservation. During our time together, we will share more about the United Methodist theology, polity, and social justice principles, as well as what membership means at First Church. We hope that you can find deeper community during this time. Now, if you'll please say hello to each other in the comments uh, and prepare for the rest of worship.
I invite you to join me in our prayer of confession this morning. Dear God, how easy it is for me to distinguish myself from them. For the times I believe I am better than others, forgive me. For the times I put my ways on a pedestal to the neglect of others, forgive me. For the times I avert my gaze so I won't have to look at their condition, forgive me. For the times I wished they would all go away and live somewhere else, forgive me. For the times I feel no discomfort in judging others before I even know them, forgive me. For the ease with which I label people them and other, forgive me. Friends, hear the good news. Through Jesus Christ, we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. God hears. God cares. God forgives. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Good morning. At this time, I invite you to hear our scripture reading from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through the town. A man named Zacchaeus, a rule among tax collectors, was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he couldn't because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus who was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down once. I must stay in your home today. So Zacchaeus came down at once, happy to welcome Jesus. Everyone who saw this grumbled, saying, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and, have and if I have cheated anyone, I will repay them four times as much. Jesus said to them, Today salvation has come to this house, because he is the son of Abraham. The human one came to seek and save the lost. I invite you all at this time into a time of prayer. 
Creator God, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks for life. God, in this season, we name how often we label others. How often we silo ourselves with voices we agree with. And we label those that we don't agree with wrong. We label them closed-minded. We label them mean. And we see the worst in them. God, in this season, we pray for those people. We pray for ourselves. We pray for our world. God, a world that feels as though hate is all around us. God, we pray that that we can be your people, a people that are open, a people that are empathetic and forgiving and that sees the best in humanity, that sees the best in our world. And God, we want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and we want to call out to those that we are different from, that we don't agree with, that we, we can so easily see as our enemy, God. We want to call out to them and invite them into our homes, to our table, to break bread. Because it is only through relationships, God, that we change. It is through tolerance and acceptance that intolerance and hate is eradicated. So God, make us a people that is welcoming and loving and that meets hate and intolerance with openness and loving acceptance. And God, we do all of this by joining our voices to pray the way in which you taught the disciples to pray. Our Father and Mother who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Today, in our sermon series, Canceled, our topic focuses on othering. As the conversation around immigration and refugees continues to bubble to the surface in our country's news cycle, we believe that these are some of the most othered people in our society today. As we move into our time of offering, we want to remind you that a portion of our annual operating budget here at First Church goes to support the work of the Alabama Interfaith Refugee Partnership. This is an organization who's working across faiths and denominations, working to help those refugees and immigrants who find themselves here in Birmingham. Some of this work is locating things like beds and sheets, kitchenware, things that make your house feel like home. Some of this work has been helping to connect refugees with their U.S. sponsor, making sure they have adequate travel and living arrangements as they await the arrival and connection to those persons. Their work is much greater even just than just these things. And I invite you to read up about it by taking a look at them. You can just Google Alabama Interfaith Refugee Partnership and learn more about this important work and the ways that we here as a community of faith are seeking to really help and empower those who are most othered among us. So this morning, I invite you to be generous. Remember that a portion of your gift to our operating budget helps to support the work of A-L-I-R-P. I hope you will be generous this morning because you and I and all of us are created in the image of a generous and loving God.
Hi, my name is Stephanie York Arnold and I'm the senior pastor here at First Church. My pronouns are she and her. Now I've been waiting this whole series to talk about today's topic, othering. So what is othering? According to Masterclass, Othering is a social process of marginalization through which a person highly values their own group while denigrating and excluding anyone from a group differing from theirs. This process lies at the heart of many societal ills, including racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. To me, even more simply put, othering is realizing someone is different from you and then you assume, therefore, you have nothing in common with them. You wouldn't like them. Matter of fact, you have reason to fear them. Now, I suspect this process of othering one another has been around an awfully long time. Matter of fact, as long as humanity has been around. But recently, I realized through the wisdom of my spouse that it took on greater significance with the rise in the popularity of my favorite television show, Lost. In the early 2000s, Lost capitalized on othering, being afraid of those not in your group or tribe. Just take a look at this pivotal scene in Lost when Jen tries to explain to Michael and Sawyer that he has found others on the other side of the island, and they have good reason to him to be afraid. All throughout the show, for seven seasons, the idea is perpetrated that others, meaning those on the other side of the island who didn't crash on the oceanic flight, are bad, essentially activating our threat system by just hearing the word others. My friends, I think this actually happens all the time in our daily lives, and we live in a culture and a society that feeds off our lack of questioning our defense mechanisms to see others as others. This first kicked in for me in the very beginning of second grade. I can still remember this moment. Back then, if you wanted to find out who your teacher was and who else was in your class, well, you had to literally get in your car and drive to the school on the day before class began because on that day they would post on just an 8 by 11 piece of paper outside the school door who your teacher was and who was in your class. I found out that day that my second grade teacher was going to be Mrs. Greer. Y'all, Mrs. Greer was a big woman who wore horn rim glasses left over from the 1950s when it wasn't cool in the 80s. She wasn't young. She wasn't um, cool. She was the teacher in charge of the bus line and she always wore a whistle around her neck. I'm pretty sure she also wore her husband's shirts and he taught at the school too. And every kid I knew was terrified of Mrs. Greer. She was intimidating. And I came home and I sat in my bathtub and I cried just like a second grader should. I wanted my mom to do like other mothers and go demand to the principal that I got a sweet little younger, prettier second grade teacher. I didn't want Mrs. Greer, but my mom didn't do that. So I cried while I was totally othering Mrs. Greer. I took bits of information and I assumed. I looked at her appearance and I listened to the rumors of other kids and I saw her perform only one aspect of her job, bus duty, where she had to wrangle all the primary school little kids onto buses. And I took all of that and I assumed that she was scary and that we wouldn't like each other. But do you know when I graduated high school, who was the only teacher that I chose to come back and say goodbye to? Mrs. Greer. 
She wasn't mean or intimidating. She was kind and funny. She was caring and she was a good teacher. She had just been othered because she didn't fit the second grade mold. Maybe it was then that my mom began telling me if I took the time to get to know others, I could almost always find something to love about them. And with that, let's dive into our gospel text this morning and see what it might hold and can teach us. You've likely always heard the story of Zacchaeus as though he was a wee little man, one that might have been curious but was no doubt a troubled and troublesome tax collector. This had to mean that he was defrauding his fellow Hebrews as he collected taxes for Rome and likely took some off the top for himself. This is in all probability how he made his wealth, and thus he was ostracized and despised by his community. He had no place because he was a traitor, a traitor, tax collector, and cahoots with Rome. <clears throat> but is that what scripture really tells us? First things first, we don't know who was short in this passage. Scripture was written without punctuation, so it's impossible to tell whether the author meant Zach was short or Jesus was short. All we know is that Jesus couldn't be seen because someone was short and there was a huge crowd around him. So Zacchaeus climbs a tree. Then Jesus tells Zach he's coming to his house for dinner and Zacchaeus is happy to welcome him. Now, I'm not sure if a Hebrew trader in cahoots with Rome would have been so thrilled to have an insurrectionist in his home, but Zacchaeus is. The people grumble, Ugh, Zach is a sinner, they say. They might as well, this might as well be Jen running out of the jungle yelling, others, others. And then right here, Zacchaeus says, look, Lord, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I repay them four times as much. Notice that these verbs, they're in present tense, not future tense. He isn't saying what he will do now that Jesus has come to his house for dinner. He is correcting the grumbling crowd. He might as well be saying, Jesus, I'm not who they say I am. And then, then Jesus says, today salvation has come to this household because he too is a son of Abraham. Jesus didn't do this in re response to something that Z Zacchaeus was doing. Instead, he is stating what is. What if he is correcting the crowd, not Zach? What if he is saying, this one, this one that you have cast outside, is also a son of Abraham, not an other? And then Jesus says, the human one came to seek and save the lost. I'm not sure he's referring to Zacchaeus here as much as he is referring to the crowd who was so quick to judge, exclude, and other another. J.D. Walt writes, So rather than this being a repentance to salvation story as is commonly read, it now looks like a vindication to restoration to salvation story. The only people who seem in need of repentance are the grumblers who are angry that Jesus went to see him. When Jesus recognizes Zacchaeus as a son of Abraham, he is basically restoring him to community. In short, just like the widows and prostitutes and the Samaritan leper and tax collector in the temple and the blind beggar, Jesus adds Zacchaeus to the list of all stars that you want to be like. It's worth pointing out that Zacchaeus, unlike the rich ruler just a few days back, is an example of a wealthy person who hits the mark. And the grumbling crowd, they get added to the naughty list. The long and short of today's lesson, be careful how you read because it will determine how you lead. My friends, this othering and canceling of people has been in practice long before we had modern language, the modern language of today, to describe it. And I'm afraid it has also always done harm. Brooke Cato, 
of New York Post writes in an article called, What is Cancel Culture? Everything to know about the toxic online trend. This rigidity right now in American political discourse is problematic because you really can't have a high functioning democracy without people being willing to engage one another in meaningful ways to hash out their political disagreements. She acknowledged that while it depends greatly on the issue at hand, there's a difference between canceling a type of behavior that is collectively agreed as bad, using hashtag me too and condemning workplace sexual harassment, for example, and the canceling of one particular person without discourse. We have to be able to come together across those political differences and sort out what are the optimal solutions, she said. We can't do that if we are dug in to our respective trenches and unwilling to engage across those political divides. When our assumptions, opinions, beliefs, values, and practices make us quick to cut others off, assume the worst and cast one another's personal value as a fellow human aside, friends, we need to circle back to whom and what we are following. No matter how much we may think we will not like someone or we may disagree with their values, their politics, their faith, when given the opportunity, there is often something that we will likely share in common. And with that in mind, I want to invite you to watch this clip from Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City, where as they discussed a similar topic, they invited congregants who assumed they had nothing in common to spend 30 minutes in conversation together while they videotaped and recorded the conversation. Watch this. So I think we disagree on virtually everything. I think we probably do. <laughs> what made you want to come here today and do this? So I've lost a couple of people in my life um, mm -hmm. recently due to politics. And one of them, who's the best, she was my best friend for 10 years. Wow. And I just think we can't live like this as a nation. And, you know, the only way we're going to be able to stop that is if you and I sit down and we have a conversation and we talk about our similarities and we also talk about all of our differences and we just appreciate who the other one is for whoever they are and wherever they came from and their background. And, you know, I think if we did that more as a society, I think we'd probably be in a better place. What made you decide to come here today? I'm asking myself that question right now. <laughs> uh, well, when Adam talked about it in his sermon, I, it sounded like a good idea. I have, like I said, I have three sons. I have one who is um, left of Bernie Sanders. I've got one that's, you know, right of whoever on the other side. And, and um, so we just got things we don't talk about. Um, and it's like, is that really the best way just to, to have things that are completely off limits? Or is there a way to, to disagree respectfully. I figured you would be further to the right, so I feel like my assumption was that you would be further, and the reality is that you are probably closer to the middle um, than, you know, than what I was expecting. So, was I who you expected to be? No, I didn't expect you to be so nice. I thought you'd be, I thought you'd be more um, um, uh, guarded, maybe? I don't know. All right, so we're going to go get coffee sometime? I think so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Eric, cheers. Cheers. Yeah. I'm not Pollyanna. I know there are people we likely can't and won't like or agree with or need to be in a relationship with. I understand appropriate boundaries and the value and need for them. I also know that if we all retreat to our comfortable tribe-like communities and see everyone else as less than, bad, or ignorant, we'll never make progress. I also know 
that unequivocally, Jesus didn't hang out with people who others liked and agreed with, but with those society seemed to other and feel threatened by. I want to challenge you as a progressive church to be liberal in the best sense of the word, meaning to be open. Not only wide in your thinking, but also open to questioning your own assumptions about one another. Don't be rigid with your love or your way of understanding. Don't be small-minded with who you might have something in common with. Don't be closed-hearted, even to those that you want to cast far aside. Love is the greatest change agent in this world. We need to cancel the canceling of one another, not each other. We need to stop measuring one another's worth by how woke we think they seem. We need to actively bring an end in our lives to othering each other when we disagree. We can do this by calling an end to the harm and hatred done in our world without being demeaning or deeming anyone irredeemable. We can be people who work for justice without being mean-spirited or self-righteous, as if we ourselves have not done any harm. Instead, let us be humble and compassionate as we work to make this world the beloved community of God, where all are truly welcome, all are seen redeemable, and all are really forgiven, and none get canceled. Thanks be to God for God's grace and generosity. May it be our model. Amen. Will you join now in our affirmation of faith, child of God? I am a child of God, God's beloved, in whom God is pleased. I dwell in the arms of God. You are a child of God, God's beloved, in whom God is pleased. You dwell in the arms of God. We all are the children of God, God's beloved, in whom God is pleased. We all dwell in the arms of God. Amen.
Friends, may we go out into our world seeking to view others and ourselves through eyes of love with a heart full of grace. May we work hard for a just world and we all have the opportunity to live equitably with freedom and with mercy. May we be people who see one another and the common humanity that we share, who care for creation, and who bring love to all. In the name of our Creator, our Savior, and Sustainer, Alleluia. Amen.